Welcome to Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials and nanoscience. Hi everyone, today we have with us Rachel Oliver who is a professor of material science at University of Cambridge. Hi, Rachel, how are you doing? I'm all right, how are you? Wonderful. Um, let's start. Uh, could, you, could you tell us how did you end up in your current research field? So I've been working in this field for a long time now. So I guess I started my PhD in the year 2000 and I've been working on gallium nitride and materials like that ever since then. Um, the thing that I was always kind of interested in as even at school and as an undergraduate is like ha, what, what materials are like. You look at them and you can see they have certain properties and you make things with them and they have certain properties. And why are they like that? And I came to understand that as a material scientist in terms of what I call structure property links. So what links the, the small scale structure to how the material behaves? Um, and that's maybe my my overarching interest. And actually, gallium nitride is a really exciting place to explore those kinds of questions because it has some unusual features of its nanoscale structure that affect the properties of the materials. They affect the devices you can make. So that was, you know, an exciting opportunity to do a PhD on these re these really cool materials. And I've just sort of followed that up ever since. Okay. Well, that structure property um, connection, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Awesome. Um, so could you tell us where and how does your research, uh, where does your research fall in this big picture of materials at nanoscience? Where does it fit in the big puzzle, so to say? So, I mean, I'm, so this kind of picture of structure property links is what I think of as kind of classic material science. There's a thing called the Oh, Milton Fleming tetrahedron of material science, which is a, a, a four pointed figure. And at the points, each of the points of your tetrahedron, your triangular based pyramid, there's structure, properties, processing, and they're then holding up the top point, which is the performance of the device you actually want to make. Mm -hmm. So that's what material science is for me. It's the link between the structure of the materials, how you process them, how you make them, what properties you get out, and then what useful things, what performance you can do with these materials. So if we kind of then dig a bit deeper into that, if we talk about structure property links, what I'm most interested in is the nanoscale structure, okay? And what's very important to me is really understanding that in depth. So I do a lot of microscopy, I use a lot of other techniques which access that nanoscale structure. Um, I guess some people, if they hear the word microscopy, might principally think about light microscopes, but I'm much more likely to be using something like an electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, things which access the properties of materials, the structure of materials, right down at the kind of few atom scale. And what I want to do is understand how the building blocks of matter down at that scale then control what you can actually do with a device which might be a light emitting diode it might equally be we make transistors for example for controlling power levels but it's all about making the material right at the small scale to get the performance you want at the large scale mm -hmm. okay wow so it, it sounds like you do a lot of cool cool experiments and you are doing a lot of cool projects um, oh yeah i mean i lead these days quite a big group so we have we have quite a few different projects going on here. Um, the stuff I enjoy most is about the light emitting devices, but we're working really hard on um, electronic devices for switching power as well these days. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. So if you had to pick, pick one research project or an experiment uh, that you are most proud of, uh, could you pick one and explain it to us in simple words, please? Huh. It's a bit like choosing between your babies. So I'm I'm very proud of the work I've done on atom probe tomography of nitride semiconductors. Now that's quite, there's quite a lot to explain there. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about atom probe tomography and what it is as a technique. Okay. okay. Um, so what we're always trying to do is look at the materials right down at the atomic scale, understand the small scale, the nanoscale structure. Okay. And 
ideally we might want to know about how the atoms are positioned but also about which atoms they are what the composition of the material is on the small scale um, and atom probe tomography is one way of getting at the composition of materials on the nanoscale are these atoms gallium are they nitrogen in a um, light emitting diode we'll also have indium gallium nitride so we'll have some indium in there we'll have some other other elements as well and what we do in atom probe tomography is we actually make our sample we start off with a, a, a semiconductor wafer effectively a plate of semiconductor and from that we create a tiny needle which is just a small piece of semiconductor um, with a neat, sharp needle point which is only 100 nanometers across ideally so a really really sharp needle much sharper than a needle you would sew with or a, a, a pin you have on a badge or something mm -hmm. now the thing about very very sharp points is you can create a very large electric field around a very very sharp point so you in traditional atom probe tomography you have a metallic needle okay so you might do this on steel or on a titanium alloy something along those lines and you um have that sticking out in a vacuum and you apply a very large bias between some kind of counter electrode and that needle you have a very very large electric field around that point mm -hmm. that electric field can actually pull the atoms off the end of the needle yeah mm -hmm and it pulls them off the end of the needle and they go flying to a detector now this is the clever bit okay firstly you need to have just the right electric field so you pull off just one atom at once and then it flies to the detector and because the end of your needle is a beautiful hemisphere it flies out along a path that follows what would be a radius of that hemisphere so you can tell where it came from if you know where it lands so it flies to the detector it lands at a specific spot and you can track back to where it must have come from so that tells you what its location was on the end of your needle okay mm -hmm. then you evaporate more and more and more atoms and you figure out which all of their locations were okay mm -hmm. and you know that you can't evaporate atoms except from the surface so the um the sequence with which they evaporate tells you you're going back through the material into the length of the needle because you have to do the very tip of the needle first and then evaporate it away and go further and further down the needle mm -hmm. so you know where each atom came from on the surface and where the surface was at different points the last thing you need to know is what each atom is you need to know what element you've got mm -hmm. and you, what you know is how long you measure how long it takes from applying a voltage pulse that causes the atom to fly off the end of the needle to it landing at the detector so you you work out its time of flight how long it took to move a specific distance now heavier things if you apply the same amount of push move more slowly so you view if it takes longer it's a heavier atom if it takes less time it's a lighter atom so that time of flight tells you what atom it is so now you've got effectively from all that information the position of the atom in 3d space and its chemical identity and you can actually one atom at a time build up a three-dimensional map of exactly what the composition of all of that material is and in metals the you can actually do that so well that you can see adjacent layers of atoms in your picture so what we call your resolution how small a feature you can measure is actually at the scale of a single atom which is pretty amazing okay so an yeah. atomic resolution compositional map in three dimensions okay now for a long time people only really did that on metals because you need to be able to apply this voltage pulse that kicks the atom the, sing the single atom off the end of the tip that's really important mm -hmm. and if you have semiconductors they're not very conductive and the voltage builds up a bit slowly and it's difficult to kick a single atom in a controlled fashion off the end of the tip mm -hmm. um, but some clever people um, in some of them in Oxford some of them elsewhere realize that you could hold the tip at a steady voltage and instead of having a pulse in the voltage you could apply a little pulse of laser light so you could just warm up the atoms a tiny bit with a little bit of laser light in a pulse and have the same effect so now we do laser pulsed atom probe and we use the laser to pulse we say we know the time of the laser pulse and we see how long it takes from the laser pulse for the atom to fly to the detector mm -hmm. okay. that means we can now do atom probe tomography well on the sorts of materials I work on like gallium nitride that aren't very conducting I have seen atom probe tomography experiments on um, ceramic materials so things that really don't conduct 
at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have seen atom phobe tomography done on Belgian chocolate. I'm not quite sure why, because they mostly figured out it contained carbon and hydrogen, which I could have told them quite quickly all by myself. But, you know, they're progressing even towards these complex <laughs> organic systems. <laughs> okay. So these days, atom phobe tomography is really really widely applied and it's becoming more and more common out in industry in all sorts of scientific fields but when i first started doing these sorts of experiments nobody had done atom probe tomography at all on the sorts of materials i work on mm -hmm. and i had a question i wanted to ask where i really needed to know the three-dimensional chemical variation inside my leds there was a theory about how they worked which relied on the idea that when you made when you put indium into layers in your led it formed like little clumps so rather than being the indium all spread out all throughout a layer in the, in the led it was all in clumps and that those clumps were completely vital to making the devices work and there was a whole group of people who said there are these clumps and they're completely vital to making the devices work and then there were another group of people who said, no, you're not doing your microscopy right. There's a problem with how you're characterizing these materials. The clumps aren't there. Mm -hmm. um, and they were doing both groups of people were using electron microscopes to characterize mm -hmm. these clumps of indium. Um, and one group thought they were doing their electron microscopy brilliantly. And the other group thought that the electron microscope was actually damaging the material and creating what looked like clumps of indium, but were actually just a product of it being in the electron microscope mm -hmm. and it was a really big row i mean literally at the point of people at scientific conferences shouting at each other and you know <laughs> it's all a bit of a problem and i thought well how can we look at this a different way mm -hmm. and i'm i'm in cambridge but i had friends at oxford who use atom probe tomography on metals and they were talking about these new laser pulse systems that might let them look at some other materials and I was like, I have got just the right first problem for you guys to try this on. <laughs> just to settle the argument here. <laughs> we are going to settle this argument. We're going to do it with a completely new technique. Um, and the trouble was we had to basically invent from scratch how to prepare the samples so that we could make these tiny needles and get them into the microscope. And then we had to figure out from scratch how you ran the microscope for this new material. Ooh. But eventually we did that and we discovered we couldn't find these little clumps at all um so and this was in good material that was useful for giving out lots of light but we couldn't find the little clumps of indium they weren't there i have to say it didn't solve the controversy mm -hmm. <laughs> because people were like oh you know that that's because you're doing your microscopy wrong you're doing the atom probe tomorrow oh, oh, um, <laughs> so, but we were pretty confident in our data i think the thing which eventually persuaded people we were doing the microscopy right is we did another experiment where we made a tiny needle mm -hmm. we took it in the tem and we bashed it with the electron beam until we could definitely see clumps we put that needle in the atom probe uh -huh. and then we imaged it and then we could find the clumps so you could actually create the indium clumps in the electron microscope and then image them in the atom probe and what was great about that was we'd firstly we proved that the atom probe could find the indium clumps if they mm -hmm. were there yeah mm -hmm. and secondly we had a piece of the same sample that hadn't been bashed in the electron microscope and one that had and one mm -hmm. of them had clumps and the other didn't so that said directly the problem is with the electron microscope the clumps weren't in the original material so uh -huh. that that whole set of work i'm very proud of because it changed how everybody in my community thought about the small scale structure of these devices mm -hmm. and also for a whole other community of researchers, it said, OK, these this group have worked on gallium nitride, which is a, a wide band gap semiconductor. It looks like it should be particularly difficult to do atom probe on. Mm -hmm. And they've used it to solve a real problem. So that means we can do atom probe on all sorts of difficult things now because they can do it on gallium nitride. So it's probably in many ways my most influential piece of work because it influenced the nitride community, the people who make the LEDs, but it also influenced people who do microscopy on lots of other materials and kind of persuaded them that atom probe was a a good tool whereas maybe before they thought well this is great if you study steel or if you study aluminium alloys but it's not for me so yeah i'm, I'm very proud of that yeah i can understand why you're proud of it i mean this this uh, this is this is brilliant i mean there was a controversy you took it um you you started working on it and 
there were still people who were questioning the, the findings, like, oh, yeah, your atom probe uh, tomography is not working or something. So you created the clumps in the electron microscope and showed that your technique works, and you actually proved uh, one side of the controversy. <laughs> there are still people arguing. I think scientists just like arguing. <laughs> You know, it's it's um, as long as it's a constructive conversation and discussion, I think it's okay. As long as it's not shouting at each other uh, at all times, I think it's fine. Or <laughs> yeah, and I think um, so. One of the things I'm then really interested in is can you create those clumps of indium on purpose? Because mm -hmm. people thought they were a good idea when they thought they were there. So can exactly. you create them on purpose? And if you do, do they make better devices? Ah, okay. Oh my That's God. a good question. Oh. I can't answer it just now, but it's a good question. <laughs> well, probably the next time we are recording a podcast with you, maybe then you can answer it. Hopefully by then you have an answer to that. Yeah, I have the beginnings of an answer, but it's quite a complicated answer. People might be bored by the end of my answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's save it for the Twitter uh, curation then. <laughs> you can engage with the audience as well, then. more than one audience then. Okay, so I must say that you explained that um, uh, probe tomography really, really well. I understood it, most of it, I think. Uh, that brings me to my next question, which is, uh, do you teach? And if you do teach, which are the courses that you would like to mention? So I'm currently, as in this week, teaching two courses. I am teaching a course called Device Materials, which is about electronic and optoelectronic devices and the materials we use in that. The mm -hmm. thing that's kind of funny about that course is that, so I'm a semiconductor scientist um, mm -hmm. and that I, I didn't define the syllabus for my own course. It was defined by my department and there are no real semiconductor devices in my device materials course. So this week I have been teaching um, liquid crystal displays. Ooh. Which is fun. It's really interesting science, but it doesn't map as well. When you say, say Rachel teaches device materials, you think, oh, well, that, you know, she's teaching about her own research. Oh, no. But, you know, I've, <laughs> I've been having fun teaching liquid crystal displays. I have some nice 3D models I have been waving at the students. We discussed um, chiral molecules, so twisted molecules, mm -hmm. using like twisty pasta this week. That was quite fun. So, yeah, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I'm teaching at the moment is a course on atomic force microscopy. Now, that sounds a bit like atom probe, but it's actually another form of microscopy. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a form of microscopy I've been using since I was a graduate student and that I, I really enjoy using myself. It's something that I have really good hands on skills at and I'm also very happy explaining. So I've been having a nice time. That's a graduate level course and um, teaching graduate students, having some really in-depth discussions with them about what you can do with an atomic force microscope. So that's the other thing I'm teaching at the moment. OK, that's interesting because I'm really happy and pleasantly surprised that there is a complete course dedicated to atomic force microscopy. This is we do a little bit on things like scanning tunneling microscopy as well, and it's quite a short course. But yeah, we do six lectures on that that general area. Uh huh. Okay. Cool. That sounds interesting. Maybe you can also tell our followers about the device materials. Uh. <laughs> oh, I'd have to, if I, if I talk, t tried to talk about that as well, I'd need another curation week. And I wouldn't be very knowledgeable. I, I do keep ahead of the students on these devices, and I, I'm sure I do know more about liquid crystal displays currently than they do, but maybe only a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can uh, draw, some, uh, draw some points from the, the Twitter community. Maybe yeah, someone maybe can tell me about liquid crystals. That would be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Let's uh, go a bit away from the teaching and more in the research experience now. Um, I'm sure you're having fun with, I, or rather I hope you're having fun with your research uh, at the moment and you had fun so far as well. Um, if you had three wishes to improve your research experience, what would you ask for? And I'm not making promises here. So, <laughs> so my three wishes would be equality, diversity and inclusion. So very, three very short wishes. I guess I can expand on that a little bit. I'm spending a lot of my kind of non-lab time at the moment really working hard to think about ways to help science be more diverse. Um, so my field is very, very male dominated and um, 
it's quite international and there are lots of Japanese and Chinese scientists involved who are doing fantastic work, but the ethnic diversity is beyond that fairly limited. Um, mm -hmm. And so because of the community I sit in, I'm kind of very aware that we're a, a quite narrow community in terms of the people involved. Mm -hmm. um, and I care about that for lots of reasons. I care about that because I think science is better when you have people with different experiences, different cultures, different ideas coming through because they can think about scientific and problems differently and bring new solutions to the table. And we need new solutions in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think science misses out from being quite a narrow community. And I think also, you know, th th this is great. Science is fun. So it's only fair that that should be open to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to talk about equality, diversity, inclusion as really three separate things, and they kind of um, build on one another. OK, mm -hmm. so when you're talking about equality, you're often talking about trying to make your processes fair, trying to make sure that nobody is biased against. Um, and hopefully that will help you achieve diversity. It will hopefully mean that there's a much wider range of people applying for jobs, coming and getting involved in experiments, all sorts of things. But none of that will stick if you don't create an environment that's inclusive, which is there where the inclusion comes in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have experienced, as members of minorities, very hostile environments in science, people's ideas being put down because of who they are, because they're female or because of the colour of their skin. And you know, there's only so long you can expect people to kind of put up with that kind of hostile environment. Mm -hmm. So in order for any of these efforts we have around, you know, policies for, I don't know, double blind reviewing of applications or whatever, to actually be worthwhile, we have to think about how we interact with one another, how we are as a community and looking after people and make sure we're inclusive and welcoming of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that in my own practice and also in the sort of campaigning activity I'm doing, I work very hard on. So that's, yeah, if I was going to do one thing about science, this is what I would do. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's, yeah, I, you, you, you summarized it really well. And I come, I'm just going to say plus one to and <laughs> you just said, <laughs> or plus 1000 or plus infinity, if that is possible to support it. Absolutely. I think it's extremely important to have equality, diversity, and inclusion, and they go hand in hand. All these three words or these ideas or these terms go hand in hand. You you put it so well. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, okay, we're going a bit away now from the sciences or still in the sciences, but not really the research part of it, probably it is. Um, what are you most looking forward to in the next three months? Uh, so this does come right back to my research. Um, so, oh, ooh, I guess nearly two years ago now, I got a big grant, ooh, two and a half million pounds, so lots of money, for a new microscope. Okay, mm. and it took where uh, took a little while for the money to come through, and then the better part of a year to do the ordering process for the microscope, because if you're ordering very expensive things, you have to stick to some very strict rules. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it took a little while to get the microscope installed and working in the lab. Mm -hmm. But as of today, it is fully signed off. Literally, I signed the sign off sheet this morning. Um, we've cool. already done quite a lot of experiments on it, but my new microscope is working right now. Uh -huh. um, so I'm really looking to see forward to seeing the new data we get out of that tool. Um, what it is, it's a scanning electron microscope, which means um, that we scan the surface with an electron beam. Mm -hmm. And there's loads of those about. The thing that's special about this is that when you um, hit the sur a surface or hit a sample with a very energetic electron beam, you get electrons bouncing back. And that's mm -hmm. what you normally do electron imaging with. OK, but you also um, create other signals within the material. So what we're interested in is the fact that you, when you hit a surface with an electron beam, if it's a optoelectronic material, you actually get light out. Mm -hmm. okay? And that means you can measure the light emitting properties of the material at the length scale that the scanning electron microscope images. So when we measure light emission properties with an optical microscope, we might be measuring them on the 
one micron scale, so one one thousandth of a millimeter. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the new system using the scanning electron microscope, we're going to be able to do a hundred times better than that. So we can look at the really, really small scale at the light emission. Now that's actually also not that new, although our system is one of the best to do that in the world. But it can do a whole extra thing, which is it can look at the time scale of the light emission. So like I was talking about the atom photomography, you make a laser pulse and then you time how long something happens after it. Mm -hmm. Now we can put in a laser pulse and well, we know we can put in an electron pulse and time how long after that the light emission happens. And we can see how the light emission rises and falls with time after that pulse comes in. Um, and when I say talk about time, the time scales I'm talking about here are tens of picoseconds. Mm -hmm. So a second divided by a thousand, divided by a thousand again, divided by a thousand again, divided by a thousand again, you get mm -hmm. to picoseconds. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did the right number of divisions by a yeah, thousand. Yeah, you did. Four times, four times ten, uh, one thousand, yes. Yeah. Okay, so these are incredibly short time scales these processes happen on. Mm -hmm. But it's actually not just seeing the fact that light is emitted. It's showing you things about the process by which light is emitted. Mm -hmm. So it's like um, if you imagine you're trying to understand an engine and you can see that there's a car that is moving. Well, great. But this is like being able to kind of lift up the bonnet and watch all the pistons moving and seeing the actual processes in the engine that make the car move. These processes, the time scales of these processes tell us about what's driving the light emission in our light emitting devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it's pretty fantastic. It's gonna let us access information about small scale structure and how that relates to the light emission processes that have never been seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna be doing that on my materials. So gallium nitride and indium gallium nitride and things like that, which obviously mm -hmm. I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. But we've also got, um, colleagues and collaborators from all over the country who are coming with different materials. So last week we were working on silicon for solar cells. We've got somebody coming in a few weeks time to look at diamond materials. Um, we have people looking at organic materials, all sorts of different things, but addressed using this new technique. It's going to be fab. <laughs> OK, wonderful. that sounds really, really cool. Um... Awesome. So before we end, um, could you tell us, could you explore a bit on uh, or shed some light on what are the challenges faced by um, the field of materials and nanoscience in general? Like what are the big challenges, the big questions that the materials and nanoscientists are trying to answer? Okay, well, I don't know if many people are trying to answer this, but they probably should. So, <laughs> so some of the devices I work on are things like light emitting diodes, which mm -hmm. Their, their nanoscale structure is really important, okay? But um, we d we're not talking about devices which use a single tiny nano object. Um, we're talking about actually quite big devices and I wouldn't say they're easy to manufacture, but they're a known manufacturing processes. And those kinds of devices, although we're still making them better, they're, you know, light bulbs, LED light bulbs are on your shelf and you can go buy one. And in the manufacturing process, they make thousands and thousands and thousands of these things and almost every one of them works. OK. Mm -hmm. And that's how manufacturing needs to be. You need to be working at a yield, a, num a percentage of working devices of, you know, more than 90 percent, probably more than 99.9 percent, .9 ideally. OK. Mm -hmm. The other part of another part of my work is devices which really rely on the properties of one single tiny nanostructure. OK, one quantum object. So that might be one little tiny crystal of indium gallium nitride that is, I don't know, 10 nanometers by 10 nanometers by three nanometers. And everything relies on that one object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we can make amazing quantum devices and we can. OK, this bare fab. If I had a second choice, my second favorite baby after the atom probe tomography, I would talk about devices based on single tiny crystals. It would be great. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is when I know from my own work, when we make these very, very complex quantum devices, the yield of those devices is terrible. If you make 100 of them and one's working, you're really quite pleased with yourself and you do a lot of experiments on that one device. And that's fab. You can write fancy papers. You can, you know, make your career do quite nicely because you're proving all sorts of exciting physical phenomena. It's all great. Mm -hmm. um, but that isn't going to go like that from the laboratory to the manufacturing environment. 
Right. You've got there's a huge amount of work to be done taking these novel devices, new nanomaterials, new quantum systems, things that really work at the pointy end, the hard end of nanoscience, and getting them from brilliant ideas that work in the lab and give you one flashy hero device to something that you can make hundreds of time after time after time and that you can sell and that will work in the consumer context. And for me, I think that's a really big challenge that a lot of the time we kind of overlook, we step away from, because it's not the most exciting bit. It's not making the thing happen for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's making the thing happen consistently right. every time. And it needs collaboration with engineers um, who perhaps have a different mindset, who know more about manufacturing processes and manufacturability and these sorts of things. Um, so people talk about this kind of valley of death for technologies whereby people can get things to the prototype stage and there's a big gap and then you're at the stage where you're manufacturing thousands of devices and you're I don't know making millions of pounds I'm not making millions of pounds this week <laughs> um and it's it's bridging that gap between the wow I can make a fancy prototype to this is something that works consistently manufacturably this is a technology that is going to go beyond academic science go beyond a university out there into the real world and make a lot of difference to people's lives and I think that gap is a big challenge across all the new technologies but perhaps particularly kind of nanoscience and quantum systems mm -hmm. okay so the basically the bridge or the the connection between the first discovery to the production line that's yeah, absolutely and uh, the community needs to work on that or someone needs to think about it and start working on it yeah and I think um so we kind of have to accept and admit that sometimes the way you made the first thing mm -hmm. and the way that eventually you'll make millions of the thing may have to be completely separate because mm -hmm. there are things you can do in a situation where your single device is so valuable to you that you can spend hours on it and effectively handcraft it, you know, and it's like, I don't know, it's like a Fabergé egg. It has, so it's beautiful and perfectly and precisely engineered by your own sort of fair hands. Mm. But that isn't a thing that allows you to make millions of devices that are off into the real world. Mm. Um, and that's another kind of part of the gap between the kind of handcrafting processes that are okay in a lab context through to the, the machine driven processes that will be the real world solution. And I think, I think a lot of people don't have, there are, or rather there aren't a lot of people with the knowledge that bridges that gap. There are people on both sides, but maybe they don't talk to each other well and they don't have a common language always. Mm -hmm. Also from the funding point of view, right? If it's a research... Yeah, there's a funding gap in the same place as well. Yeah. So there are like a bunch of uh, factors which yeah. are not so really helping easy. the valley. It's, it's never easy to get grant funding, but it's much easier for me to sell as a concept. I am going to make the first XYZ than yeah. I have shown how to make XYZ, but the yield of my device is only about 3% and I need to get it up to at least sort of 50 percent before anybody in industry will have a conversation with me that's hard to sell to a grant funder <laughs> it's not that that convincing or it's not that exciting probably so the funding yeah. structure also needs to be changed to some extent yeah think. and i mean the in the uk the engineering and physical sciences research council has a whole strand on manufacturing so it's not that like the the funders are completely ignoring this but i think it's still a place where more work is needed Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 a very um, very fair point and a fair fair challenge, and I hope we are working towards it uh, in the scientific community. Um, Rachel, it was lovely to speak with you. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Uh, no problem. And we, we look forward to your time on Real Science Nano. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for listening. To know more about us, please visit our website realscientistsnano.org and follow us on Twitter at realsci_nano.